Hello everyone. Okay. What up y'all? I'm gonna give everybody a few minutes to join. Okay, folks. Ah, there we go. <laughs> we here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yo, so something so crazy today. Um, I was looking at, you know, over your press kit. And then look what came in the mail. I had ordered this uh, Tribe Called Quest Survivors Kit. Wow. It's, it's wow. really some geeky shit. It's like a, a mask Ooh. and sanitizer and stuff. You know? Oh, wow. That's, that <laughs> looks like a collectible right there. I love it. I uh, saw because I, you know, I saw that you had said you got, you know, looked at the hip hop videos from oh, yeah. the 90s. So that, that electric relaxation video was a big um, inspiration for me. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm yeah. so honored to have you. What up, y'all? So Everybody who's here. joining. Yeah. How are you doing? Awesome. Um, so before we begin, let me just set the stage. We're going to let some people join in and then let me go to voices. Uh, uh, here we go. Um, yeah, all right. So for those of y'all who do not know what's about to go down, we're about to have a conversation. Um, tell your friends and all your peoples that need to be in this conversation to come visit us. Um, join Vias for Voices and that they're missing out. So for those, of you, those of you who don't know what Voices is, Voices is a new interdisciplinary performance arts project and campaign grounded in Black women's stories by V-Day to unify the vision of ending violence against women, cis women, trans women, and non-binary people across the African continent, African diaspora. Our goal is to use art to embody and inspire solidarity making in our collective imagination. And we're creating a new piece that will center our movement to replace the quote unquote vagina monologues for those of you who know what that piece is. Um, and this is part of a virtual listening tour where we are listening to artists, storytellers, incredible women, black women in the world who are using their voices and their crafts to transform the conditions of their lives and those they love. Um, we have today our sister, winner of the 2020 Institute Vanguard Award and Sundance Film Festival, U.S. Dramatic Directing Award. Rada Blank is a director, performer, writer, and proud native New Yorker, a Helen yes. Merrill Award recipient. Rada's acclaimed play Seed was deemed fresh, lively, and poetic by Huff Post. She's since written for Empire, and she's got to have it. Rada's script for the 40-year-old version was chosen for the 2017 Sundance Directors and Screenwriters Labs and garnered the 2017 Adrian Shelley Women's Filmmaker Award and the 2018 Maryland Film Festival Producers Club <laughs> Award, just in case you didn't know. When not writing for the stage and the screen, Rada performs as Rada Miss crime <laughs> brand of hip-hop comedy has sold out shows from new york to norway all right so join me in welcoming right now the one the only okay pull up get your drink get whatever you need <laughs> you definitely get your drink please because <laughs> i have a feeling it's going to be intense what people don't know is that we had a pre-convo before this convo yeah boy it was and it was therapy. different energy it was mm -hmm. just, you know, it's what needed to happen. I'm actually glad that we were able to be there for that conversation. And it centered me. Um, it was necessary for me to hear. And I also just feel like this is why we're doing this project, is we want right. Black women to be able to share their voices, tell their stories. 
Um, and it, at first we were, we were gonna title this conversation, you know, the power of a relentless story because something about how, mu how much you faced in adversity and the perseverance of that, sure. it, it embodied this relentlessness of black women, um, endurance and perseverance. And then after that conversation, I was like, wait, this is in the tradition um, of, of radical truth telling, which is necessary now more than ever while we walk on eggshells with each other, um, being polarized in different ways of seeing the world, that we have to complicate the world through our truth telling and through yeah. our experiences, what we're actually feeling. And, uh, yeah. and so much of us are just trying to keep it together, you know, do what we got to do to be uh, performative and it's just not realistic all the time um and so before we kind of get into all of that i as a native new yorker someone you know what i mean speaking to another new yorker during yeah. these times i wanted to ask you what's one of your favorite childhood memories about growing up in new york city wow it has to be so i grew up i always say i grew up in brooklyn but i came of age in harlem and I grew up on the south side of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, if people can believe it. Um, it is not at all what, <laughs> today it is not at all what it was then. I'm very nostalgic and romantic about it, but there was a theater called the Commodore Theater on Broadway on the south side. And we would see karate flicks there every Saturday for like a dollar, something like that. Um, and, um, you know, I grew up on the south side of Williamsburg, so... For 14 years of my life, you know, like I, I talked like I was Boricua or whatever. And so like, I think about <laughs> I hear all it's the 14 kids, years of my you life. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think about all of the kids like Papi and Ito and Ma and, and Gucci and Carlos and all of the kids that my brother and I grew up with on the south side of Williamsburg. It's just, I don't even think the shell of the theater is there anymore. But um, what about yourself? I got to say, there's nothing like summertime New York City, Brooklyn, mm. and the fire hydrants. When my mm. uncle used to open up the fire hydrants for us. Yeah. And when we used to be able to go, my grandmother used to send us out the house, like, leave, leave, leave. Yeah. She wanted to be there. <laughs> and we used to go um, get the free lunches. I was like, I know you from New wow. York if you have free summer lunch. If your grandmother See, sent you for free okay. summer lunch. You're a grown man because I don't, you're, you're a grown woman because there are not that many people that I know of who, so you're young, but you, you're I'm 33. Young. I'm 33. You're old young because that, that, listen, there's a smell of like that turkey. There's a smell of that free With that lunch. cheese. And the, the way cheese, it that thick, thick, thick <laughs> cheese. <laughs> The white bread and the milk, the little carton of milk. That the we little got. carton of milk, and the way the way you had to open up the carton yeah. with the, with the cardboard and you right. get stuck sometimes. Yes, and sometimes they had an apple juice in the same kind of container. Oh my God! Listen, there's an IG uh, run by a native New York brother, um, New York Nico, and he okay. has these things now where he's like. She ain't old enough for you if she didn't remember that this used to be. And he'll name like Chock Full of Nuts or Ricky's. Woo! To, or or um, what was the record? Um, Tower Records. You know, oh, Tower Records. When this was Tower Records. Um, it just, I just find myself so nostalgic about the city these days because it's changed so much. I mean, COVID aside, like I don't know what it's going to be after COVID, but... Um, I think that's probably why I shot the movie in black and white so that it would feel like a a time capsule, you know, like of that New York that we grew up in with the hydrants. Yeah. And, I was you know, going like, to totally ask you about that because I was like, well, you know, let's go into it since you talk about the, in the conversation we had before you said like a lot of people don't know that you as a black woman, that you're a cinephile and that you I love, love film. Yeah. And, I think it's so important for us to even talk about black women as film lovers. Like people don't really think of us as film lovers because we have still yet to be discussed as directors, as writers, as producers, et cetera. Um, I just started talking with an, um, another filmmaker about this 
film, this black woman filmmaker, uh, Sarah Maldador, Maldador, some, anyway, she, she did an incredible film mm -hmm. and no one knows where the film is. They can't, they're, her family's trying to like re-push the film out. So I wanted to ask you, what is, um, what are some, one, what does it mean to be a black woman as a cinephile? What are the films that you've loved, watched growing up and how did it inspire the way that you shot your film? Yeah, my mother was a cinephile. My mom, who was originally from Newark, New Jersey, um, very much like the film, came over to New York with dreams of becoming a, a famous artist. And there were films that informed her, even as a painter. And so it's like a lot of the films from the 70s, a lot of films by like Hal Ashby, um, Sidney Lumet, um, John Cassavetes, and... Um, you know, I discovered Kathleen Collins much later in life, but these were people that my mom, you know, turned me on to as a kid, you know, watching their films. And so uh, a part of me, and then of course, there are, other, there are two other filmmakers that people tend to compare me to. Um, one sounds like Shaikh Shi, and the other one sounds like Shmudi Shmalin. And I, I take that, I take, I don't mind that people compare me to those people because they made films that will stand the test of time. I think what it does do sometimes, though, is it does slight me as if I haven't studied numerous films. So I've been looking at black and white films since I was a kid, from Night of the Hunter to The Apartment to Some Like It Hot to Citizen Kane to Diamonds and Night. You name it. Like, wow. I just, black and white films are not very foreign to me. And so I just wanted to draw from black and white films would draw from classic New York tales and create one that centered more on us because I've loved a lot of these films, but even in terms of She's Gotta Have It, I don't see myself necessarily in that film. Um, I, it might be because it's a man's version of, of this female character. And so I'm just keeping it real, like, you know, and I, I'm sure Spike would agree to that, that like, it was, you know, he says his biggest influence in that film, making that film was Rashomon. And, and that is a Kurosawa film about three different people's accounts of this thing that happened. And so that's how he built Nola. Was, it was through the eyes and accounts of these three different lovers. And so it had a male gaze on it, you know? And so I, I do hope that people learn more about my other influences, um, but the biggest being my mom as she loved a lot of film and that might have surprised people that this black woman was kind of obsessed with all kinds of films foreign films black and white films but she was my she planted the seed of of cinema into me the first time you know yeah, yeah that's it's so interesting because with the last conversation we had her mother was a theme is a theme in her life as well and the way that she communicates even in spite of life and death and so one of the things that you said that I read in, in one of your pieces was in the, the interview was my mom uh, was the person who put the seed of storytelling in me when I was eight years old. And I wanted to ask like who, basically who do you believe put those stories into her and what gifts in her paintings um, showed up in your films or showed up in your storytelling over time? Because yeah. I'm sure painting reaches you in a different way. And it's so important for kids to have young people to have an array of art forms to pull from. Yeah, well, just very quickly on painting and fine art, some of the other influences for me for the film was the work of Carrie James Marshall and Carrie Mae Weems and um, Ray De Carava and Jamel Shabazz. These are all black, either photographers or painters who, you know, in their own way are challenging the image of blackness and and what it means to be a black person through their images and so they had a huge influence on me making the film but for my mom it was her mother martha who was like an avid reader and you know they would go down and look at the the little movies at the you know the five cent film or what have you but it was my grandmother who i've never met you know she passed away before i was born um but she put the the she planted the story, she planted the seeds of story in my mom and then thus she then gave that to me. But um, yeah, I, I find myself sometimes envious of fine artists. Um, I, I love that with film, you get to collaborate with other people, but because you're collaborating with people, there's a, it 
takes a certain amount of time and energy and you have to kind of always pull in and touch on these voices whereas the painter you know they're alone with the painting and they step away from the painting and it's done whereas mm. you know filmmaking is about engaging an audience and you know hoping that a cross section of people get it with painting i think the artist is allowed to be more abstract and obscure you know like it's in the beauty of the beholder and it doesn't have to be this large cross section and so i do sometimes envy a fine artist and painters in the power that they have and the and and how solitary and so you know the solitude that comes from creating a work and walking away from it you know mm. but but i i i just have so many influences where this film is concerned and so i'm hoping that you know if you notice there are a lot of mirrors that show up in the film um and that is a direct connection to Caroline Weems work where it was to me she and Kath Kathleen Collins were some of the first black women artists who I say like centered black women in the way that they did in the image of the black woman unapologetic and and I'm I'm not talking about the black woman that we see in the mainstream who her hands are on her hips and she's sassy and she knows it all I'm talking about the contemplative black woman like like that was huge to me to see that in Carrie's work you know that she, this woman is looking at herself and and she doesn't have all the answers or in Kathleen Collins work the reason that film Losing Ground which was her only mm -hmm. feature film shout out to Nia Collins her daughter Nina Collins her daughter um um you have this black woman who is a philosophy professor who's married to a very avant-garde and kind of spacey painter and even in the position of of a revered philosophy professor she doesn't quite know who she is yet or she she's having a crisis of identity and i feel like maybe this kind of gets back to the whole point of this kind of conversation is as as black women in story we're not allowed to be contemplative we're supposed to be all knowing we're supposed to be this ever growing bosom for someone to fall into and be nurtured and rock back to themselves and then they go off and tell a story um or they go off on a journey of self discovery and so Kathleen Collins and Carrie Mae Weems um i find that there are you know many more black women who are who are centering that contemplative black figure but those were the first that i came in contact with and so i hope to create more work that does that where as black women in 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 our own stories you know we don't know it all you know and that we can we can be the hero and we can be the person going on the discovery as, as opposed to the person on the sidelines who we often we know it all and we're magical and we you know we're with that sassy friend who lets us let's just say, hey girl you look great you know as opposed to being the person who is contemplating their own image in a mm. mirror we just mm. i just i mean i don't know about you i just don't see that a lot where the with a black woman character is concerned or their own like sexuality like one of the things that i really loved in your you know um film was that it wasn't there was no definitive around like someone's sexuality and fe and needing one needing like a black woman needing love and that looking however we want it to be there wasn't um there's i think you wrote about um or or there was in one of the in the interview in the um press kit there was something around how queen latifa what queen latifa did for you as a representation yeah um at the time when so much of our our identity as as black women is tied around like this Jezebel character or this man right. character or these like kind of these certain tropes of our stories and that our sexuality is complicated and so right. why can't we be why can't us being a lyrical wordsmith be mm -hmm. sexy well you know it's it's funny that you say that because i am you know there's a moment in the film where she goes back to Dee's place and he's kind of ignoring her he's really being like the mr miyagi to her karate kid trying to see like how bad she wants this but for the most part not really seeing her until she starts rhyming that's what he falls in love with and i feel like i also don't see that kind of black man <laughs> either in storytelling who you know yeah okay aesthetic is important but really it's about the soul connection between the two of them like 
they bond over the loss of the mother, but they also are in some way using the culture, you know, or needing the culture to get through their trauma or their frustration, you know, their, their loss of the mom. I feel like he doesn't know, but he's looking for her. And it's the same thing with, with her, you know? So it's not about aesthetic. It's not about, well, you fine and all this other stuff. These people are really, they kind of floundered into each other's lives. And until she hears the beats and he hears her rhyme, there isn't a love connection. So it does speak about black love happening in ways we don't always see it. it we, yes, we lust. I know because I do it all the time, but that's not always how we come together with someone. I remember one of the great loves of my life. The reason he and I got together is because he had a septum piercing. <laughs> and as a person with a very full nose, I was always self-conscious about that. And mm -hmm. I remember looking at the septum piercing, not really him, but the piercing and being like, but your nose is so big. I was like 20 but your nose is like wide and you're drawing more attention. He said, yeah, that's why I did it. And I sure enough got me a septum piercing because it, it's just this meeting a person who in the moment becomes a mirror, at least for what you want. And I always wanted to accept my broad nose and he was this person who I would normally find myself attracted to. You know, so I do, I do hope people see that in 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 the film and the other thing i i feel is um my version of activism in, in in telling black stories is yes making a woman of a certain age still sexual still vibrant still contemplative but also this idea of contemplation and mundanity where it comes when it, when it comes to black storytelling you know like yes we get lit you know what i'm saying people in the streets celebrating you know the 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 election results and we do that that's true but also when i wake up in the morning i don't wake up and start rhyming off the top of the mouth you know i don't do that i'm sitting in the bed like maybe massaging my aching knee or you know maybe i let out a fart i don't know like we are quiet and contemplative and we don't i don't feel it's why i love films like medicine for melancholy right but i remember mm. seeing a movie called ghost story with Rooney Mara, where she plays the lover of um, Casey Affleck. And he has died in a car crash and has come back and is haunting her as a ghost that she never sees. But in her grief, she sits down in front of the stove and eats an entire pie on camera mm. from crust to dust in silence. There's no cutaways, there's no jump cuts. It is in real time that she eats a pie. And I said, wow, can black storytelling and black visage get that space to be mundane, to be quiet and contemplative? That is what I'm working towards because mm -hmm. that is just a level of our humanity that doesn't get played enough. I mean, even in the editing or pr promotion of this film or putting the film out, people always talking about cut it down, cut the air out, right? But sometimes I think we need the air in our storytelling because just taking that breath, it just affirms that like everybody else in the world, we are thinkers, we are contemplators. We're not, we're not here for the entertainment of others and we're not here to solve their problems. We have our own problems and our problems are not always connected to our pain. You know, like, can we, can we remove this idea that Black pain is our conflict in our storytelling. When the conflict may be about a, a almost 40 year old woman who's trying to figure out who the hell she is. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I know I'm kind of going on a tangent, but no, I guess I'm just trying to relate this idea that like, I am not the most um, verbal or articulate activist, but my activism is in trying to manipulate our image, maybe manipulate is not the right word, but shape the image in a way that reflects our authentic black life. Mm. You know, in the film, I think she's challenged with this um, gatekeeper, this white gatekeeper who is deciding based on the wants and desires of the silver hair patrons, like what version of black life gets to be on the stage. And so 
I'm hoping that the film is a part of a conversation of like visibility and inclus inclusion in theater and film, but just speaking on a whole about like, you know, just the, the nuance of our humanity showing up in story. And I feel like a lot of that doesn't show up if we are solitary, if we don't have the producers, the gatekeepers, the green lighters who look like us, who can affirm that yes, the, there can be these moments of silence because they do exist and they, or to advocate for those things. I don't know that someone who's not of the culture wouldn't fully know how to advocate for black stories that are not the stories that a, a, a salge or affirm whiteness or whiteness's idea of blackness. Am I, I'm, I know I'm going off the topic, I'm sorry. It's just- You're not going off no topic, <laughs> you're talking about, you're talking everything. It's so powerful because I had seen Garrett Bradley's film, Time. Oh. And oh, that film is so good. And there's this moment that. where she forces us to sit with the, the, the wife um, waiting on the call mm. and that pause of time. And you realize how much time we spend navigating the whoop de whoop de whoop de whoop of white terrorism's mythological, hysterical identity crisis that we, we, we literally are just kept away from the preciousness of our time, our ability to contemplate, our ability to mm -hmm. meditate, our ability to dance, laugh, love, right. live, or be silent. Sex. Right. He, whatever, you know, right. um, stare at a, at a fly all day, whatever we want to do. And the idea that somehow the myth mythology around our quote unquote laziness, right, mm -hmm. which made us, which created this false fear around being able to sit and be present. Oh, honey, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You know what the revolution is? Blacks at leisure i went to i'm not i'm not being like you know pretentious or whatever but i went to the vineyard with one of my best friends elisa blount moorhead who also lives here in baltimore um we were sitting in a lagoon in the back of the house that we had all rented and we were just listening to music and we both dead ass started crying because we were so relaxed i just don't remember being that relaxed in a long time and i looked i'm always making this joke about whenever somebody goes to eat a piece of cake or they indulge in something I always say y'all listen that's what harriet wanted son like harriet busts off shots so that you could contemplate that strawberry shortcake like that's freedom right there and i and when we were sitting in the back of this house at this lagoon I, we were dead ass like teary I'd like, yo, for real, like Harriet Tubman, like, could she even imagine that we would have the space and freedom to sit in a place, our, to lay our black bodies down in the sun, in a space and feel safe. Like that to me, to be able to sit on a porch somewhere and just read for hours and not look up because you hear something or you're on alert. Like, I forget where we were. We were in another part of Baltimore and we just went inside to a friend's house and she left the door unlocked. I said, girl, come on, I'm from New York, what are you doing? She said, no, 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 it's good in this neighborhood. And it was. And so I think about things like that. And I think like, really like, what it means to be at leisure and to be free in your black body that when those spaces do come like we have to soak them up you know we have to soak up the silence you know we have to soak up the um what seems mundane you know because who knows what's going to happen two hours from now but to give ourselves permission to like I don't even know if it's indulging because indulging feels like it's something you're not supposed to do or have. Yeah. But that we have a right to safety, to silence, to contemplation, to mundanity. We have a right to all of that stuff, but we've been somehow conditioned. And this kind of came up in our conversation before, especially as black women 
to always jump in to, to solve. Listen, I give Stacy, I give her all the praise. All of those sisters, um, the organizers, part, yeah, all the, the organizers who did what they did in Georgia. Um, but there's also a part of me that's like, that's what we do. That's what Black women do. Is we go, I remember there was like a hashtag or like a meme that was like, fuck it, I'll do it. You know, because that's what we do because we have been conditioned to get up. If something is wrong, we got to solve it. If if someone is in need, well, it's our job to fill that need. And I, I'm, I'm glad that we're naturally talent at, talented at doing that. But again, how much space is left for a black woman for herself and for her to take that space without before anybody else can do it calling herself selfish you know like i i feel like we have been or without to helping to carry the load you know like the, the or to take the load like let let you rest while i because things have to get done but we all have to see what's it's 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 enough of letting somebody else be the one that carries all the weight um for this country to to, to survive and so i think i've been so um resistant to this notion that somehow black women saved Amer america and we always have been saving america that's not from the beginning of time never been in question but somehow when you create a hero, it's also the place where you start to tear them down. You know, it's like when you right. put somebody on a pedestal, you're quick also, to kind of throw darts. So right. don't make black women no hero of yo messed up, fucked up, white Please terrorist don't. story. But don't. create the conditions by which we all take accountability for, for and responsibility for the lives we live so that it's not black women having to raise up your babies and your and your your decency your country you know and I, but i but how can we create more awareness like on a one-to-one -one or just in a circle of black women that we have been conditioned to serve right and that to not do it is to be selfish mm. like how do we how do we start to shift that thinking um so that when a sister says i'm tapping out it's okay to tap out because maybe you need to go replenish yourself and go take, just take care of you. You know, why have we immediately, you know, I'm going to be honest with you in terms of like making the film, it, it took every molecule of my body and I'm still recovering from a film that we shot in 2019. But the assumption is that as a black woman, you know, I have to now, create mentoring opportunities. I have to mentor one-on-one. -on -one. I have to, you know, raise up, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, okay, yes. But maybe my work is the mentoring. Maybe the work I create is the thing that may heal. Can I go over here and be human? I honestly do not find my male cohorts in the same space. Oh, for sure. There's, the a, there's another... There's another male artist that I'm working with, and he's a he's a film director. He works on short films, and when I talk to him about what I find that my struggle is like, I think about my audience. I think about who sees the things that I will put out into the world, and it was so yeah. interesting and exposed a lot in my mind that he was like, "My audience is me. I create for me," and I was like, "Hmm." Do I feel it? like I know this person. We'll talk offline about who it is. But listen, this could be five, I was like, duly noted. <laughs> five of my male filmmaking brethren, you know, that they they say that and there's no guilt around saying, no, I'm my first audience and I make the work for me. Whereas we've been traditionally, you know, kind of conditioned to be the caretakers, to, to have the bosom ready to suckle someone else's dreams or ideas and to lift people up. And, um, you know, I, it, it just, it's always put on black women to do that. So I, I, we definitely need to applaud Stacey and all those sisters who, Latasha, all the people who've been just pushing, pushing, pushing to make sure that, you know, 
our rights around voting are protected and secured. Um, but it's okay if you're not that person and you yeah. don't take on that role. Like, I think as Black women, the most radical act of, of love for Black people is to take care of oneself. Because, you know, if you are falling apart, you're having depression, your health is off, you, how are you going to be good to anybody? Like, you got to be, you have to take care of oneself first. And I'm learning at this age, I'm in my 40s now, I'm still learning how to take care of myself. I, mommy, I love you to death. I didn't have the best example. I don't think that my generation, the term self-care, <laughs> it didn't exist, you know, for my parents. Um, but now we're in a place where um, everything just feels a little bit more precious, you know, because we're all under a microscope and we're all, you know, we have access to information through social media. I mean, there are all kinds of opportunities to, to learn and gain and get information. And so I just, I, you know, I'm, I was telling you the other day, I'm tired. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm just being real. Like as a black woman, I'm tired. I feel like, you know, COVID definitely put us in a place where, you know, we're having to worry about the welfare of our families and our own health and well-being. But long before COVID, like, there were all kinds of emotional and, and, and mental pandemics that we've had to deal with and, um, and yet still be expected to lift up a race of people. You know what I mean? And uh, so, I don't know, I just... I'm hoping that I, there's this thing I discovered uh, in the last year, the nap ministry. I'm bringing naps back, yo. Like <laughs> that midday 20, that's what I call it, the midday 20, to just lay your body down and close your eyes. You don't have to go into deep slumber. No. To lay that body down. Even in this pandemic, for those of us who are not working from home and all that stuff, you don't realize how tired you are until you just lay on your side and you go, Ooh. oh, those 20 Zooms, man. That shit wore me out, you know? Ooh. So, yeah, I Naps. just feel like for, for even just, if you, if you, if you want to take on the role of being a radical or, or taking on a role of being an activist, I really feel like you have to be just as radical about your own self-care and self-love um, or you're really going to break down because... This world, I first of all, I don't know what it would be without a black woman, but it for sure hell, you know, leans on us to pull it out, pull it out of the fire, and then once we do, we still get blamed. For, yeah, for not I doing think, something right. I think one of the things that I I try to model in my life, and it's not been easy. Is there's definitely been a lot of times where it's been very, very exhausting. Um, and that's why I think I resonated with so much of what you shared on the pre-call. But a big part for me is understanding what does it look like for us to democratize self-care so that every person has the right to rest and every right. single child has the right to playtime and bewilderment and joy. Um, and that we know we have all the resources we need in this country to allow for leisure for every single person. Every Ooh. single person should have the opportunity to leisure. Like in Europe, people get four hours, but they don't do nothing in the middle of the day. You right. know? So to understand that my self-care doesn't have to come at the expense of your self-care. And this isn't about individualism. This is about all of us knowing that in order for us to be a collective, we have to have our individual selves yes present to show up fully for the collective we don't want yeah. a bunch of people mourning and sobbing and like fully unfunctioning that's not going to help us as a community so we need to be invested in your care as much as we are in my care and the sisters care down the street and three other right. people care it has to be about how do we allow people to have that collectivized leisure that we're talking about because american capitalism makes it so much so that the assumption is productivity means working, right? You're working, you're free. When you die, exactly. Yeah, 
You, if, you, exactly. if you're working, you're free, you got money, you could buy things, you could do all these other things. And it's, it's not, I think that's what the, the artist's ma imagination plays in because Amir Baraka has this quote where he talks about, there are people who actually believe that politicians are more powerful than artists. What a bizarre mm -hmm. lie. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so, so funny because artists have this capacity when they're really tapped in and they're able to look away from society, which is why it's good that an artist is not a politician or not sitting around pontificating too much with, right. with, with organized. They have to have some level of healthy distance to look at the society and say, what's missing? What are the things that need to be resolved in myself so that I can show up better and also imagine the radical sort of futures we want to see? Right. And I wanted to ask you, what are some of the um, uh, imaginative things you want to see in the world that you have not seen? You've named a little bit around care, but what are some of the artistic things you want to see in the world and the ways that maybe our society could be set up? Yeah. 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 Um, I was a teaching artist for many years, just like my mother. And it's what I did to support myself. And it's what she did to support, um, to supplement her career as an artist. There wasn't a whole lot of money in the seventies and eighties as a, as a painter, if you weren't, you know, anointed or what have you. Um, and, you know, I was a teaching artist and I think I had a particular way with kids from certain schools and certain neighborhoods because I was that kid. I was the kid that was getting like C's in math and science, but in English and arts, A plus, college AP, you know what I mean? And so what I what I think needs to happen is we really do, just in terms of curriculum in schools, we need to bring arts up to the sacred level of these other um, academics. Because if it wasn't for arts, I probably would just fall through the cracks. I was very outspoken. I would challenge a lot of my teachers. But m my art became my level of intelligence you know like it became respected after a while you know because i would be at every talent show i'd be organizing this dance or this comedy skit or whatever um but i think you know art is not a place where you send a kid after school as punishment well now you have to go to the painting class. like you get to go to the painting class you get to go to ceramics i think that you know bringing that up and and respecting arts and also creating learning environments where young people can challenge the authority in the room at some point where i don't know there was a there was a high school in new york and i i think this place is gone but the the class was more the schools or the class the curriculums were more based on philosophy and debate and challenge and cr critical thinking like to to give young people permission to be critical thinkers early on when i was teaching an after school film class Tuesdays and Thursdays, or Mondays and Wednesdays would be about what we were creating um, after school. And then Fridays was like, we would watch films and critique them. And my thing wasn't like, oh, we're not going to say whether or not this film is bad or good. Tell me why it doesn't work for you. Be aware of what you're consuming. It's okay, even if mass media says this is the shit. If there's a part of you that says, I don't like this, this isn't for me. We're now helping to cultivate discernible, discerning black youth, you know, so that they're not just consumers. They can say, no, this isn't for me. I have a, a niece, Sunny Moorhead. She's applying for all of these colleges now. And one of the things I said in um, the letter about her is I love getting into you know, talks with her about what she loves. She loves Grand, Arm Grand Army. And I'm like, I don't know if it's that authentic. She's like, yes, for Auntie Rada. You know, like, I love that at 17, she has been encouraged to challenge the adults in her life. I mean, that's how you get leaders like yourself, you know, who at a very young age are like going to rallies and, you know, teach-ins or, you know what I mean? And so... I, hope, I wish that we would value young people and actually have real discourse with them as opposed to just kind of writing them off. Because when I think about who I was, I mean, I did my first solo play at 20 years old. I wrote it, performed it, and that's what turned me into a playwright. I thought I was doing it to get more 
acting gigs. You know, it was like a showcase type thing. But we were like, that play was actually great. Who wrote that? I did. And they were like, what? You know, so at 20, you know, there was enough seeds planted in me to where I felt like I had an authority uh, or autonomy to tell a story from beginning to end. And so mm. those are some of the things. I mean, there's so many things, you know, like, I was like, one day we gonna have, me and you gonna have to have a side conversation about what you think about Lovecraft because I want to know what you think about that. Oh, girl, but I have so many opinions. <laughs> I have so many opinions, and um, wow. I like yeah, that. let's not go into. Let's not go yeah. into it. I keep thinking about that little black girl with that robot arm, but we're gonna talk Woo! about that. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, yeah, but no, you know, the ability to tell new stories and the 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 ideas around those stories. One of the things I would wanted to ask you was. Um, what would you tell your, what would you have told your 25 year old you to support you now in this moment? What would you have told if your 24 year old person told you now or 25 year old? Be more open. You know, I think, you know, one's personal baggage, it can be a, a, a golden bag, you know, like depending on, um, what kind of stories you want to tell, you might dig deep into that bag and, and pull out a very um, interesting legacy, you know, maybe a painful and tra traumatic one, but it may be the thing that uh, pierces an audience member. I think my baggage caused me to just not trust many people. And um, my father was right about some of the things he warned me about, but I also think he was an angry, bitter artist. And, you know, one time my dad, um, this is when I was probably in my mid 20s, maybe around 25, we're in Harlem because that's where we ended up moving to, um, even though my parents weren't together. And he walks, he's walking me down towards Fifth Avenue or 125th Street. And I'm like, what are we doing? And we stop and <laughs> we, st I love you, dad. We stop in front of a podiatry school, <laughs> 125th Street. And my father, who, has played with Sun Ra, Laji Kamara. He was trained by Art Blakey. You know, he had this wonderful legacy. It didn't, it didn't flourish as much as it should have, but we're standing in front of the podiatry school and he's like, yeah, you know, you might want to, because I was studying film at City. I was like, really, Dad? You think I want to look at some nasty-ass, funky-ass feet instead of struggling as an artist? And, you know, but, but it was very telling to me. I'm dead-ass. He was trying to convinced me to be a podiatrist but it was very telling that you know in spite of the things he had done the recordings and also being an artist was painful for him that you know they, they didn't have a social media where you could cultivate an audience in some ig lives you know like he was on that hustle like everybody else and he was also battling uh substance substance abuse you know and you know he I don't know that the, the though the community was very strong. Again, you can create community with anybody in the world now. And I feel like my father might have felt very isolated. He also had a lot of issues around being um, around his complexion and having blue eyes, but having a very, very black and African heart, you know. Um, but yeah, like that, I, I would have just told myself, be be more open you know, because now I'm still, I'm in this age now in my 40s, I'm finding that I need to be more open to get what it is that I need. You know what I mean? Um, so mm. I would just tell her to be more open. Mm. More yeah, that's so beautiful. And okay, what are, um, well, I want to, this is a twofold question. So what are, who, who or what are some examples of Black women that have held you during moments of, of difficult grief? And what are ways that we need to show up better for each other? What are the things that you think Black women are, are struggling through in terms of how we show up for each other? Because there is a whole kumbaya narrative around Black women saving the world, but we still got a lot to do around dealing with ourselves. So, um, yeah. We got to save example. ourselves first, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I lost my mom uh, right after my 40th birthday. And what's so interesting about that, first of all, we had the same birthday and we were best friends. She was the Sophia to my Dorothy uh, in Golden Girls com comparisons. Um, and losing her, like to lose a loving black mother 
I know that some people, all people didn't have that, but when you had it for so long and this, you become enmeshed with this person, I was lost if it was not for the black women who, all my friends who helped me up, Elisa, Denise, Bronke, um, Busayo, Adipero. I mean, just the women who literally became like my back to to hold me up in this moment because here I'm a person who who owned a home. Uh, well, actually, I hadn't owned a home yet, but I I was my career was on the rise. I had a heart profile, a growing profile. Blah blah blah. My mom, mama dies. I'm ready to go. That's how I felt, you know. And if it wasn't for me, you know, because you still need that when you've had it most of your life, you still need that mother nurturing. I got it from the women in my life, the black women in my life. And then the second question you asked was, what are things we need to do to work on better in our, in our relationships with each other, supporting each other better? And Yeah, I think one, it's okay if we don't have an answer for somebody. It is okay. You know, like we, I want us to give ourselves permission to not know something. It doesn't mean we're dumb. I actually think it's very smart. Like I admire, I'm very loquacious, I talk a lot. I, I love watching people who don't, who just sit back and they listen. Um, and those tend to be the people who years down the line, they'll bring up something from seven years ago because they were listening. You know, they've been able to kind of store. Whereas I think we talk and we, we're maybe trying to expel a demon or trying to fix a demon in somebody else and, 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 and thus fix it in ourselves or feel like we're being helpful, you know? Um, but sometimes to sit in silence and sit in not knowing is such a powerful place to, to sit. I remember a friend telling me like, you don't know what you don't know. And so let's give ourselves permission to do that. Cause what it means is, more room for self-discovery. You're not locked into any identity because it is forever evolving because you're giving it an opportunity to do so. Like, I think it was interesting being on set and being in this very powerful position, but really I feel like I was a leader because I also relented when I didn't know something. I'd rather let the person who does know have the moment and solve the problem. Um, that to me is, is I've, I've seen that in teachers, like knowing when to talk, when to be silent, but that it's okay to not know everything and to take the time to do whatever it is to, to fall in love with. Let me not say fall in love with yourself, but like to really get to know who you are. And I think uh, just bringing it back to this idea of, of aging too, like, you know, I always say 20s, I thought I knew. 30s, I realized I ain't no shit. 40s, I didn't give a fuck. You know, like, you know, like give yourself permission to um, to age. It's okay to age. Yes, my eyesight is not what it used to be, but my glasses are fly, so there's that. Um, but give yourself permission to age um, and give yourself permission to keep learning about yourself and what it is to be in the world. Because I think as a young woman in my 20s, a lot of what I thought, you know, was my philosophy generally came from a lover or from my parents or from a community. And I just kind of, I find now like, I love being at this age and being like, well, what is that about? I don't, Oh, I didn't, oh, I never heard that song or I never, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I do think that that means like maybe putting your ego aside and allowing yourself to be this kind of soft and malleable person, but just to give yourself permission to not be Miss I know everything. No, be the seeker of the knowledge. You don't have to be the holder of it. Person. Yeah, especially that's so powerful for this because um, we call this the listening tour. And most of the times what I've learned from, from one of my professors way back when was that the power of talking and the cure around talking is actually listening. Um, and so when we're talking, we think we're talking for the other person, but we're actually like needing to listen. And it's, it's, a, it's a mode of 
yes, there's truth telling, but there's also like truth listening and learning when yes. to listen. Wow, yes. And I think that that's something that you just like brought back. So one of the, I have two final questions. And one is, mm -hmm. if there was a question about your work that you wish someone would ask that they've never asked you before, what question would that be? Wow. You'd be like, if I knew, they would ask it. But um, <laughs> maybe take more, your yeah, maybe more about what inspires me because I think as a black woman, people really make certain make certain assumptions, like the comparison to Spike. I get it. I understand. You know, and it's not a bad comparison to be made. You know. Um, but I'm inspired by so much more than that one film, you know? And so I, I do wish people were a little bit more curious about that instead of saying, oh, child, this is an A plus a B plus a C. And I'm like, well, if you have access, you should ask me because, you know, I think people would also be surprised that, you know, there are a couple of dead white guys in the canon of films that I've studied. You know, I think, you know, I see a film like Francis Ha, and no one compares that to Spike's film. It's also black and white about a young woman trying to figure things out, you know? So it's like, you know, just again, going back to being open is like, you never really know. You can't make assumptions about somebody's work just on face value. Like I look at an, a painter like Titus Kafar, who I don't know if you know, familiar with his mm -hmm. work. I love his work. Just, you know, I just, I don't, I don't necessarily need to hear him talk, but I love hearing, oh, really? Because I thought, and then you re you find out, now there's a different context of the thing that you've been looking at. I mean, the great work to me, it just speaks for itself, but I, I still would never assume that, oh, well, Titus looked at a dollar bill and that is what inspired him. Um, that's not necessarily the truth, that's just, um, I think it goes back to art education, what you're saying, which is like, there's these individual problems that we have with this current world as it is. And then there's these systemic solutions that need to really happen mm -hmm. um, and shifts and changes that need to happen for us to have a society that's more appreciative and valuing critical thinking and questioning around art and, and um, why things are set up the way they are. What are the... What, what, why is healthcare the way it is? Why is our schools the way they are? Why is our housing the way it is, yeah. right? Um, and so it's so important for us to encourage young people to ask questions about challenge. that. Right, challenge it. And one time I met this young, very, very young couple. They were maybe 20 and 21 at a dinner party. And um, I had a play called Seed. It's my only real like production even though I have 12 plays, that's my only um, production. And it's okay that I was bitter as a playwright. It gave me a story to tell. If things worked out in theater, you and I probably wouldn't be having this conversation. About oh, just letting you know, we have one minute and 55 oh, seconds. Shit. Um, but anyway, so these young people, they were like, you write a blank? I was like, yeah, I am. They were like, oh my God, oh, so nice to meet you. And I'm like, did you see my play C? They were like, no, we didn't see it. But it's so great to meet you. I said, oh y'all, don't, don't do that. Don't give your power away. You don't even know if you like my play. Like, don't allow a higher profile to, you know, turn you into someone that would, you know, worship. Like, I shit like everybody else. I get cramps like every other woman on a period. Uh, well, maybe not. You know, maybe I need to do that dairy-free diet. But, um, damn, there's only a minute left. Yeah, like... Um, I just feel like no matter what position you are in your life, don't give your power away. Even if your favorite mentor walks into the room, a person who you've admired, you know, you admire their work. You don't know them. So mm. don't give your power to them. Uh, continue to love the work. Let it inspire you. I'm a person who's kind of self-taught. I kind of created a curriculum around for many different things. Um, but I let my mentors kind of mentor me spiritually as opposed to putting so much on a human being. You know? mm. Always remain the powerful force in your life. Don't mm. give that to somebody else. Thank you so much. We got Thank 30 you. Seconds. Everyone so nice who's following, 
space. Yes, everyone who's following, please.